using them as fully and completely as we can, embracing them as completely as we can. And today we're on the second principle, my essence is of God, and therefore I am inherently good. This is certainly the, um, this is the, the principle that brought me to unity when I heard Eric Butterworth in, in New York speaking on Easter Sunday and talking about the Christ as innate in all of us, and I had never, ever heard that before. Um, raised Catholic, and they never told me that. They never said that. So it, is, it means a lot to me because it was so, it was so shocking. It was so surprising. Uh, it is what really defines unity, in a way, is our insistence on the divinity of every person. I, you've heard me quote before my favorite Franciscan theologian, Richard Rohr, and um, he wrote this this week, as a matter of fact. Like knows like. All awareness, enlightenment, aliveness, and transformation begins with recognizing that your own eternal DNA is both divine and unearned. Only then are you ready to see it everywhere else, too. Soul recognizes soul. So this principle is really the doorway into the other three principles that we'll be looking at in weeks to come. Because you can't begin to work with principle if you don't accept yourself as divine. That's simply a basic truth. You can't, um, you can't pray creatively if you don't think you have the right to do that. If you're still sneak, sleeping, slipping into, um, into beseeching prayer, hoping that a God out there will make a difference. Uh, it's very easy to do, isn't it? Um, but we, we pray differently, and we'll be talking about that in a, couple of, in a couple of weeks. Our understanding of the second principle has grown dramatically, even in our, um, even in, in our time in unity. You can see, if you look at the large board in front of me, that it was, it was expressed differently here. Um, and even in Ellen Devonport's wonderful, wonderful book, The Five Principles, which only came out, what, three years ago maybe, um, the emphasis is still slightly misplaced. It reads, human beings have a spark of divinity within them, the Christ spirit within. Our very essence is of God, and therefore we are inherently good. Now there's no problem at all with the second sentence. That's the one we now use. We've taken out the first sentence because to say that human beings have a spark of divinity within them creates a duality, doesn't it? There's a human being, and then within that human being somewhere, there's a spark of divinity. That, that used to be how unity presented this, and it's changing very quickly, I think, to recognizing that there is nothing about you that is not divine. So there's no human within which the divinity rests. That creates a lot of dichotomy. That creates a lot of negative judgment of, of, of our humanness. That's where I think traditionally churches have frowned on, on, on sexuality, on anything that is specifically related to being human. But everything we do as humans is divine. There's no separation, and we have to know that in order to move forward, because otherwise we're constricting ourselves a lot, aren't we? If we're just confining ourselves to do, doing things that we're told are good, uh, that's very constricting. That constricts how we can affect and touch others. We have to know that everything is divine. So any way I relate with others, there is divinity in that relationship. They are divine. I am divine. And being able to see that, being able to work with that, to know that going forward is tremendously important. It's more helpful 
and closer to spiritual truth, I think, if we think of ourselves as a trinity of spirit, mind, and body, all equally divine. Spirit, mind, and body, all equally divine. They are not separate entities. They're kind of like ice, water, and steam. They're the same essence at different levels of density. They're not separate things. And here's a key point. It's entirely possible to move freely from one state to the other. We don't have to leave body and mind behind us to reach the realm of spirit. It's always an integral part of us. We can access our spirit self anytime we choose. We can bring that spirit into expression through our body. We can bring that spirit into expression through manifestation, which is the, which is the, uh, the ice part of that, that analogy. So we have steam, water, which is our own nature, our own humanity, and then there is what we create using that truth, and that is, that is the ice. That's the manifestation we see and work with around us. The idea that we must somehow overcome humanity in order to become spiritual is often traced back to Paul. Paul gets a little bit of a bum rap for a lot of things, I think, uh, or at least to interpretations of Paul, especially in Galatians and in Romans. He, is, he talks a great deal about the flesh versus spirit, the, the, the attraction of flesh versus the, the attraction of spirit. But he's using the word sarx, which is usually translated as flesh. That's not wrong, but it's tricky. The exact same word, for example, is used in the Gospel of John, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Richard Rohr suggests the more helpful translation might be ego, so that we are, our ego nature is the flesh aspect of it. But there is no separation between that and the spirit. And there is nothing, there is nothing out there other than who we are and what we are together. The divine is eternal, it is everywhere, it is always. So there is no, there is no separation in, in our ability to move from manifestation to thought, from thought to manifestation, from spirit to manifestation, from spirit to thought. It's all part of the process. And the more aware we become of that, the more comfortable we are working with the process. And working with the process is exactly why we're here in human form. Because why, el why else would we come into these bodies? You know, I don't think any of us thought this would be a a lot of fun. This would be a rich experience. I'll just go into a body for a while, uh, like I'm going on vacation for a week. No. We are here because we agreed on a very deep soul level. We agreed to be part of the process of creation. We are the cutting edge of creation. There's a wonderful play that just reopened in New York. Um, called Angels in America by Sir Tony Kushner. And one of the powerful spiritual awarenesses in that play is at the end, at the end of, the, I don't know, the third act, I think, an, an angel appears, not wafting in like you would expect an angel to appear, but th thundering through the wall, <laughs> knocking things down. And it turns out that the angels are upset because the cutting edge of creativity is here with us and they're feeling kind of left out. So there is a deep, deep spiritual commitment that we made. We are obviously very connected spiritually in our truth, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. And otherwise we wouldn't, once here, have made the journey that each of us has made to come here, be here this morning, to know the truth. And I don't mean just the journey this morning. I mean the journey through a lifetime that brought you to this awareness, 
to a, to a point where you are open to remembering these principles and putting them to work. But we can't put them to work in the world unless we own them ourselves. We can't affirm divinity in the world if we don't believe ourselves to be divine. It sounds like an egotistical thing to say and do, but it's not. It's the height of humility. I'm not myself, I am spirit. I am here for spiritual purpose, and I am open to learning what that purpose may be, and to seeing that it will express through my thoughts. It will express through what I make manifest, what I create in the world. And somehow, as we improve that process, as we improve the thoughts that we're holding in consciousness, and then and therefore improve the manifestation, that is what Jesus called the kingdom of heaven. We are creating the kingdom of heaven here, now. There's no other place, there's no place we go after we die where heaven is. Heaven is here as we create it. It's here in potential always. And it's up to us to manifest it choice by choice by choice. So our human nature is the water of steam water ice. And the danger lies in believing ourselves to be trapped in our humanity instead of recognizing it as an integral part of our innate trinity, fully as divine as spirit. It's, it's really a jolt, can be, to think that everything I do, every thought I have, Everything I make manifest is divine by very definition because everything is divine. We already, two weeks ago, we affirmed that God is, every, God is all there is. There is nothing other than God. So the idea of dividing into good and evil uh, doesn't work anymore. The idea of dividing into spirit and human doesn't work anymore because it suggests that God is somehow not in our, in our humanity, but only in our spirit. Are we connected to God? That is, not, that is not the truth that we need to move forward with. The truth is that everything about us is connected to the divine, which can be a little frightening, but it's also very exciting. It gives us the opportunity to use our humanity in wonderful ways. It gives us the opportunity to stand with a new perspective, a new spiritual perspective, and see everything in our lives in a different way, from a different angle. Like, like hearing uh, I release sung by a different voice. It's the same, the same words, the same melody, the same message. It's just there's, there's an interesting shift. There's an interesting shift in perspective. We can do that all the time. When you find yourself, I don't know, facing a really serious problem and trying to solve it from your human nature, which is what we always do, it's important to step back for, it's, to spirit, to the realm of spirit you are, and say, show me, show me how to see this. Show me the good. I've said so often that is the only, the only affirmation we really need Show me the good, because that's, that opens the door to everything. So that leaves the third leg of the Trinity, manifestation, and that becomes the process of creation, and that's what we'll be talking about um, when I'm back with you in two weeks. Until then, be alert, be aware, explore how easy it is to move from spirit to human and back again, realizing that you are never trapped. It takes a little bit of practice. That's what we're here for. So there's no time like the present to start. And as I have been doing through this series in particular, I want to open it to anyone, any questions or any thoughts that you all may have, um, because I think it's really important that we get comfortable with these, with these principles. Any questions? Makes sense? Mm -hmm. Do you feel any resistance to it within you? Any ego voice saying, how dare you? 
<laughs> Who do you think you are? We drift through we drift through all of that, but eventually we come to knowing who we are. Who we are is divine. Who we are is the divine. Yeah. So when we don't get an answer uh, right away when we ask for help with you know something that's troubling us, that's uh, you know that. How would you describe that and you know to hang in there with that faith? Well, first I'd ask, from whom you think that solution is coming? Well, it's coming from within you. But the, the higher aspect of me, the yes. divinity within. And a lot of times, you know, it's not like things change immediately. No, not at all. So to hang in there and to kind of trust that things will work out when you ask for help and call on that divinity within, I think there's some discussion about how to, how to weather through that. Yes, well, um, we, we go back to show me the good, you know, the, the, the challenge there is that if I go into meditation, if I go, if I access my spirit self um, with a very clear un idea of what I want, you know, I want a relationship, and I want it now, and I want it to look like this, and I want it to be this old and this young. Um, that gets in the way. It's show me the good is I don't, I give up the right to decide what I need to, to answer this perceived lack in my life. I don't know what that means. Show me the good. Show me the way in which perhaps you, perhaps I have to start by appreciating where I am, rather than focusing on where I'm not, what I don't have. We, everything begins with appreciation. So if you feel frustrated that a prayer isn't being manifest, um, it, it, it can well be that you are being too specific about what you expect. You're not being open to the good that is expressing, uh, show me the good. It always comes back to that. Yes, David. Yeah. I wrestle with the idea, if, if in essence we are God, then what is the ego self? Is the ego self part of God too? Well, sure. Oh, yeah. So if it were, God wouldn't the ego be... Ego self. God, if it weren't, God wouldn't be on the present omniscient and omnipotent, which we affirm God is. And what, what we understand when we use the word God is. So that the appearance of duality, which involves the ego mind, is part of the process of creation. It's part of what we came here for. Because this is this goes back to conversations with God, but um, God needed to experience God's self. There can't be creation if there's an, if there's no duality, if there's no if there's nothing to create against. There can't be a, we can't create this if there if it's already everywhere. You see what I mean? So we agreed to come into this illusion of duality, which involved to to which involves the ego mind which consists of our input from our senses, from our thoughts, from, our, from what, what we've been taught, um, from what fears we have as a child. All of that goes into ego mind. Spirit has the ability to go into ego mind and ruffle through it, like going through a filing cabinet and picking out something that may be useful and leaving the rest. Because having an ego mind is part of what we're here for. But believing ourselves powerless over the ego mind is not what we're here for. There was another hand. No? Yeah. I appreciate your articulating all of this because it does, in the modern world, seem outrageous to say, I am an emanation of God. 
Um, but I do know that that's true, and what you just said about that the ego is a necessary uh, part of the awareness process, and it's not bad, has been super helpful for me, that that's how I, as an aspect of God, come to know that I am God. And I just appreciate your saying it out loud, because there's not many places where you can, I speak for myself, I feel comfortable saying that out loud. Yeah, it's, um, you know, being human is part of the journey, even if we're fully aware of our Christ self. Uh, somebody asked me this week, you know, I answer Bible questions on the Unity website, and somebody asked me about Jesus um, healing the man who was beset by demons by sending the demons into, the, into pigs, and then the pigs ran into the water and drowned themselves. And the question was, how can Jesus do that to pigs? You know, if he loves the lilies of the field, what is, what is it with pigs? And the only answer I could come up with is Jesus made mistakes too. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus was human before he became aware of his Christ self. And he didn't stop being human when he, when he was baptized and became aware of who he truly was. He didn't let go. You can see also in the, the, uh, the, the, the fig tree outside Jerusalem that he curses because it doesn't have any figs and he's hungry. And Mark in particular makes a point of saying it was not the season for figs. It was not the fault of the poor tree. You know, the tree was just doing tree stuff. Um, <laughs> Jesus allow, can allow his humanity to express too. Uh, what's important is that he didn't say, you know, don't ever tell anybody I did that, or don't write that down. <laughs> um, he said, okay, let's, let's look at the truth of this. I told you that we have power over, that's when he does his, his famous move the mountain analogy. If you tell that mountain to move and have total faith and do not doubt, that mountain will move. Um, so he turned it into a lesson for himself and for and to share with others. And that's, I think, what we all do um, at, at our best when we're working with ego mind. But thank you for, for that awareness. Yeah, go ahead. Well, what comes to me as you're saying that is that we're all creators all the time. When we're in ego, we're just not aware of it. And so we're like loose cannons creating all sorts of wacko things that we then think are attacking us, but we don't realize we're actually doing that. And, and as we become more aware and more in our Christ, which is love, then the creations that come back at us are more loving. Your one principle ahead of me will be discussing that when we talk about the third principle, which is how our thoughts become manifest, mm -hmm. and which thoughts become manifest. And the fact, as you said, that it's not just the thoughts I choose to manifest that become manifest. Mm -hmm. It's every thought I choose to believe mm -hmm. that becomes manifest, whether I wanted it to or not. And as you said, it's helter-skelter until we learn how to control it a little bit, how to focus it, how to work with it. Uh, in a constructive, creative way. Yeah. Can you explain um, Jesus' Jesus' questioning of the going going on of the world? What was he, his questioning of what was going on in the world? I don't. I'm not sure I understand. Um, well, he did question what was going on in the world, right? I mean. Well, he, he made choices about what he chose to support or not. For example, uh, there were a lot of people who wanted him to become a, you know, a radical rebel and lead an armed, resurrection, an armed insurrection against the Romans. That wasn't his path. He didn't judge it. He didn't judge those people who do choose that. He just, that wasn't his path. Uh, there were other people who thought he should join the Essenes and go up into a cave somewhere and just avoid the world altogether. But that wasn't his choice either. He said you have to be in the world, but not of it. So I don't see him judging the world so much as reminding us that we agreed to be here, and we're here for spiritual reasons, and so there's no point trying to, trying to avoid it 
there's no point trying to make ourselves more spiritual. Well, we can't be more spiritual. So whether we sit in the cave on the mountaintop or whether we're out working with our hands in, in the city, um, we are creating. We are that creating energy. Does that... Yeah, I, 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 I didn't see him judging the world. He was certainly very aware of the world and its implications and, and the choices that he was making. Uh, he was very aware. But he wasn't judging. He wasn't judging it. He was just making choices. He was making creative choices that allowed his ministry to thrive in such a way that here we are 2,000 years later talking about him and, and his work and his words. Okay. Well, let's turn to our music team again. I hope this is useful to you, helpful, interesting. Absolutely. And uh, I hope you'll be here when we continue the series two weeks from now.